It's Mother's Day weekend, and I'm sure all the preparations have been done. If you have a mom in your life, to be sure to honor. You know, I, I've got my card in the mail. Nice little note with it. And if you don't already have a reservation for a restaurant tomorrow, oh, 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 it's just not going to happen real quick. And maybe there's a nice gift. I mean, whatever detail, you, you do it because, you know, it's mom, right? And, and okay, and so you, you get it done. And, and if you were just to think, well, maybe I won't do it this year. Okay, yeah. Um, no, it, they're all nice and it, and it must be done. And yet, of all the things that, that can be done for mom and, and are done, it's really the, the quiet conversation of a family. It's the gentle grasp of a hand to hand. It is the warm embrace. It is the heartfelt words and the eye-to-eye contact as it is communicated, I love you, you mean the world to me. If you are able to give and to receive this kind of love, it truly is a gift from God. It is this kind of intimate family dynamic and situation that Jesus found himself with his disciples as the words that are captured in John's gospel that you heard read earlier. This wasn't a public discourse like the Sermon on the Mount where, you know, people were, you know, from all over and maybe they knew Jesus, maybe they didn't know him, maybe they've just come curious to see. No, this is a select and an exclusive group of chosen, appointed friends that get to hear these words of Jesus. We, through John's gospel, are invited into that intimate family conversation that Jesus is having, and we are invited to believe that just as these words were spoken to them, that they are also spoken to us. The words of Jesus, as he said to them, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved loved you. Now remain in my love. Of all the nice gifts that God has given to you today, and that you woke up today, and that your body was working in fairly normal parameters, all your seven systems from muscular, skeletal, respiratory, blood, Electrical, everything was functioning well enough to get you here tonight. It was a gift of God. And that you ate some good food, had clean water to drink, you had transportation to get here and back, and that you have a family life and a work life or a retirement life. Whatever the gifts are, they're, they're just wonderful. But of all the gifts that God has for you, it isn't until these words finally settle in to your soul and you really hear them and believe them that you are truly loved by God with an immense kind of love that is almost beyond understanding that the, the love that the Father has for Jesus is the same love of quality, of quantity, of any measure possible, is yours. I don't know if you've spent much time really considering those words or the fact that God loves you. If it's often said in worship, then it's often ignored. But it, at some point... Our, our ears really are attuned to it. And once you finally hear it, one of two things happen. You either believe it or you don't. But we don't normally really spend time considering where I'm at. I invite you at a quiet moment with you and the Lord to really search your soul and to ask 
within yourself if you really believe that God loves you. Because the soul longs to be loved. It is in a constant search and a desperate, a desperate, uh, well, that's the reason that uh, marketers play on our need for love because we're so desperate and we need it. We think that we can buy this. We think that it will come packaged. We think that if we, if we have finally a settled peace in our home or, or the job that we want and, and all of our life is coming together, then finally we'll, we'll be settled in that, in that peace and that love. But it is only with the love of God that our souls are at rest because he was the one who made us to be loved this way and to actually receive it. Do you believe this love? Sometimes it takes some perspective. Sometimes you just got to get out a big telescope to see God's love. And this is the 25th year anniversary of the Hubble Telescope. And it actually is going to help us tonight get some perspective on God's love. Some of the scientists who actually run this thing on earth noticed that there was this dark spot in space. It's just a little tiny sliver if you were to look at it with your naked eyes. Like, well, there's nothing there. And so they thought, what if we trained the, the telescope on that little spot and let it just soak in whatever light's there? And so they, they did that for 10 days. And guess what they saw in that dark spot of space? That's what they saw. And those are not stars, those are galaxies. And in that little patch of dark spot of space, there are over 3,000 galaxies, much like our Milky Way and even larger. And our, our Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years from one end to the other. And it's filled with stars and presumably planets and worlds. And the God who made all of this, who knows each one of these galaxies by name, each star, each world, who can see every sunrise as a planet comes around its orbit, its orbit who knows every moon and every comet, every asteroid, every molecule, everything about this, he has you on his calendar. The love that the Father has for Jesus is also for you. He knows when you rise and when you sit. He perceives your thoughts from afar. What is man that you're mindful of him, the psalmist asked. You made him a little lower than the angels. And yet he is mindful. The next thing that Jesus said to his intimate collection of friends can be easily misunderstood, easily confused. Because what Jesus said next, he says, if you keep my commands, then you will remain in my love. Just as I keep my Father's commands, and I remain in His love. Just as we were kind of basking in the love of God, and it is great, He loves us, then we realize the party's over. There's an if. If, wait a minute, I, I can't go the if. Jesus, you can. You faced all kinds of temptations. And you were like, no, my Father's word says this. He believed every word of God was true and authoritative, and he did it. He calls his God, his Father, Abba, my dear Father, even as he's praying in the garden in which he will be turned into a, just a horrible flesh a stump a pierced man on a cross dying forsaken of God. He remains faithful and obedient to his Father. But as you and I hear these words, we realize, well, this is a deal breaker. And it isn't because that it is impossible in reality. It's impossible because that's what we believe. We just don't believe that it is even desirable or possible to keep the commands. 
Certainly the command to love one another. Love each other. Because if you have to love some people, well, that means everybody. Because that's how God, he, he doesn't have a list of the people who are in and people who are out. He loves everybody. And well, that includes then our national enemies, right? People who are terrorizing us. People who are doing all kinds of bad stuff to us. It also means personal enemies. You know, people have made our life miserable. Maybe some people have criminally hurt us or abused us. Our list, though, goes beyond the monsters, but it's rather long because it's also people that are driving too fast or too slow. It's people that have just slightly different bent theologically or politically. Just listen to the contempt in your voice as you talk about what's going on. The list includes people that, well, you just don't want to be around. People that we intentionally avoid. When we hear Jesus say, remain in my love, love each other. There is a belief that's going on in our hearts that says, I don't believe that I have to love everyone. And that's where Jesus catches us. Because who gets to say the have-tos and the shoulds? Who gets to make the rules? Is it the created man and woman? Or is it the creator? Of course, he's the only one that gets to say, thou shalt. And Jesus said, and here's my command, that you love each other. Now, for those of you that are here, you, you at least have a, an honest heart to realize, well, wait, wait a minute, I know I can't do this. I know my heart is not that loving. And so, here's the out. I'll confess my sins. I will say I'm sorry. I will tell Jesus you are right. I am not. And his blood shed on the cross covers all of my sins. And we'll just kind of go through life that way. I'm forgiven, but I'm not going to keep your command. Does that sound right? <laughs> okay, okay, let's try it again. But what if I try real hard? I mean, you can't fault you for that. You know, okay, Jesus, you forgive me my sins, and I will try, at least try to love other people. That are, I'll grit my teeth, I'll be the better man or woman, and, oh. But we know that trying doesn't work either because we've tried. You know, and there's just some people that are just beyond our level of what we can do. And so we, we could just, uh, just live in that forgiveness and, and trying, but, but Jesus is, we're too dear to him. We're too close to his heart. And so he has, he has come to us to give us another way. Well, what could be the other way? If it isn't trying harder, and if it isn't just giving up and living on forgiveness, what, what could it be? But as we hear this command to love one another, it is to ask. Jesus has invited us into a relationship with himself where we might remain with him, remain in his love, where we can actually ask him to do what he has commanded. Jesus I don't have it in me to love one another. Jesus, will you give me that gift? Now that prayer really comes in three flavors and varieties because there's really three major situations that you face because somebody's always thinking faster than I'm preaching and they're going, well, well you're not asking people to remain with an abuser and that makes no sense. Well, you're right. That makes no sense. And so this prayer, this first prayer goes right to that. And the prayer is to Jesus, who we've been invited into this ask relationship. Show me how to remain safe with my enemy, with this abuser, and love him or her. Show me how to remain safe. As a country, 
as an individual, as a spouse, as a child. What that does is keep you safe, but it also keeps the humanity of the monster. There's no longer any monsters in the world, but there are people. People for whom Christ loves and died and desires to change a heart just like he's changed yours. The second prayer. The second prayer is for our own stone-cold heart. Because sometimes we are so bitter and so hurt and so angry and all that we have inside of us, there's just no way I'm going to ever forgive, let alone love this other person. And yet Jesus said, here's what love looks like. Love is a friend that gives up his life for the friend. You are my friends. That's the kind of love I'm talking about. It's like, whoa, I am so far from that. My heart would never do that or even try to do that. The second prayer is, Jesus, come into my heart and give me a, a heart that loves, that can love. I believe that you can when I cannot. I believe that you can change me. Jesus, come and soften my heart. The third prayer. This prayer is that a realization of what's really going on sometimes is the reason I don't want to love you is because I'm trying to compete against you. I'm jealous of you. I want to be the center of attention. I want the accolades. I want to be better. And so the third prayer is a confession of sin. Jesus, come and heal my heart. As we come to Jesus with these prayers, the end goal isn't that we finally, you know, are doing the right thing. The end goal isn't to keep a law or a command. The end goal is joy. Jesus said, I tell you all of this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Imagine the joy of truly loving another person, especially one who has been an enemy or a monster. Imagine the joy of truly getting along in a family, in a congregation, at school, at work. Well, it's not just an ideal or a dream. It's the reality that is being and remaining with Jesus. It is possible because he is the one who loves. May the Lord bless us as we love one another, as we rely on Jesus. In his name, amen.